everyone. I'm Karen Lips, the president of the Network of Enlightened Women. And today I am joined with Tara Ross, who is an expert on the Electoral College. She is nationally recognized for her expertise and is the author of several books on this subject, including Why We Need the Electoral College, her most recent one. Her Prager University video, Do You Understand the Electoral College, is Prager's most viewed video ever with more than 60 million views. That is very impressive, Tara. <laughs> she has appeared on a variety of talk shows nationwide and regularly addresses civic, university, and legal audiences. She's appeared on Fox News, C-SPAN, and NPR, among others. Tara is a retired lawyer and a former editor-in-chief of the Texas Review of Law and Politics. She obtained her BA from Rice University and her JD from the University of Texas School of Law. She resides in Dallas with her husband and children. Welcome, Tara. We're delighted to have you. Thanks so much for having me. Yes, yes. So I want to know, how did you become an expert on the Electoral College? <laughs> well, the answer is going to take you by surprise. It's a funny story, actually. Um, this sounds like a tangent. It's not. I was in a car wreck in January oh. of 2001. I broke my writing arm. I was still in my last year of law school. By the way, always wear a seatbelt in the car, no matter what, even in a taxi cab. I know we like to get in and just pop in with no seatbelt. Well, I was not wearing a seatbelt and I broke my arm. Oh. So, but then I, I had to get through law school. I couldn't take notes in class anymore. And so I decided to do an independent study on the electoral college because I thought, how hard can that be? And, you know, I can type with one finger or whatever. But um, it turned out that I learned so much about the system. Um, people don't always remember this, but during the fall of 2000, it was actually being predicted that Al Gore would win the electoral college vote and lose the popular vote. And in October of, of 2000, he was preparing to defend that kind of a victory. And then of course the exact opposite happened and George Bush won the electoral and lost the popular. And it just showed me as I was studying the electoral college that spring, how easily this can go in either direction. And it's not a partisan system, it's just not. And either, so I thought, you know, either it's a good system that needs to be defended on its merits or it's, or, you know, it's not, it, it's not a partisan thing. And I learned so much about the electoral college that spring. I had no idea that nobody had ever taught me these things. <laughs> and so, I mean, that's just kind of how it started. So that, that was accidental to say the least. <laughs> Well, it worked out. I mean, you're one of the few people I think is writing on this, um, which has become such a hot topic. So could you talk about the role that the Electoral College played in the 2016 election? And then, since we're so close to the 2020 election, what role do you anticipate it playing in 2020? Well, um, it, it plays the same role every year, really. In 2016, we paid more attention to it because the results were so close. I guess you could say, but what the Electoral College does for us is it encourages coalition building and working together and reaching a hand across the aisle to someone who's not quite like you to try to learn about them. And the reason that there was a discrepancy in the, the vote between the electoral and the popular vote in 2016 was because the democratic base of support was too heavily or too isolated with one kind of voter. If you look at the kind of voter that was supporting Hillary Clinton, it was predominantly, you know, the kind of voter who tends to live in big cities. She had 20% of her support from only two states, New York and California. And if you take away, and in New York and California, I should add, most of that support came from the big cities. So if you take away those votes, Donald Trump is actually winning by 3 million votes. Um, it's the same thing that happened in 1888, where Grover Cleveland lost the electoral vote, uh, won the popular vote. But if you look at the breakout that year, he, he was winning landslide victories in six Southern states. He was getting literally 72% of the vote in those states. And he wasn't doing nearly as well in other parts of the country. So 1888 is an easier election for us to look at because we have no emotions attached to that. <laughs> but I would argue that it was the right result for the Electoral College to give us the candidate that was not handpicked by a handful of states. So now I'm speaking of coalition building, and I know that sounds really strange when we're all like at each other's throats and angry and divided. It does seem like a, a far off concept right now. <laughs> it, it does. And, you know, I've been saying, I think we're in a period of time that is a lot like the period of time we were in after the Civil War, which, so again, in those late 1800 years, division, anger, you know, it just looked like the Electoral College map was going to be the same over and over again. There were actually two elections where there was a discrepancy between the electoral college vote and the 
recorded national popular vote, just like we have today. And the Electoral College helped us to come out of that place. And the reason that that happened is because back then, okay, if you're a Democrat, you cannot win the White House based in reliance on only your safe areas. There were not enough, enough Southern states to make that happen. If you're a Republican with your strength, mostly in the North and the Northwest, you can win, but kind of barely. And if the Democrats make any inroads at all, as Grover Cleveland did in 1884, you're gonna lose. So over time, both sides had incentives to try to figure this out. I can't just cater to my base. I can't just sit here, you know, surrounded by people who already like me. I got to figure it out. And indeed, by the early 1900s, Calvin Coolidge, FDR winning a massive landslides. So I'm, we're in the same place today. Our parties are broken. They are a little bit too busy catering to their base, not enough busy <laughs> reaching a hand across the aisle or trying to build coalitions in the middle. I guess we're going to do that again this year. <laughs> but um, I have been saying the first party to remember the purposes of the Electoral College to focus on our similarities as Americans, what brings us together, you know, that is, that is the party that's going to start winning in landslides and take us out of this place that we're in right now. Well, you've talked about reaching across the aisle. And again, it feels like such a um, far off concept, but it is so important. And could you talk a little bit more about um, the purpose of the Electoral College and how unique it was um, when that was adopted at the time? Sure. Well, I think I always think the best place to start talking about the Electoral College and its purpose is to look at the foundations of the entire Constitution and some misperceptions about that. We, we hear people talk about spreading democracy around the world and, you know, we have a democracy in America. Well, we, we don't really. We have democratic aspects to our system. But the, fa the founders were actually, they were looking for something better. Now, think of the world as they had you know, they were looking at it back then. They had just fought this revolution from Great Britain. They had shed blood. They had given brothers and sons and mothers and daughters to this cause of self-governance. You know, no taxation without representation. They didn't have a seat at the table in parliament. They wanted to be in charge of their own destiny to be self-governing. On the other hand, they remembered something that we forget. Even if they had been given a seat at the table in parliament, it wouldn't have been enough. They would have been outvoted time and time again by the majority of citizens at home in England. They still would have been tyrannized. And so they knew this is actually a pretty difficult problem. How do you create a society that's self-governing but also protect minority interests? The modern day example you've probably heard sometimes is two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner is not, <laughs> you know, that's a democracy. The sheep got a vote and the sheep doesn't care that the sheep got a vote. The <laughs> sheep's still on the dinner plate, right? So how do you create something that's more fair than that, that's just? How do you create a society that does not enable bare or emotional majorities to tyrannize everybody else? So the founders solved their problem by creating a constitution with checks and balances, separation of powers. You know, we have three branches of government. We have a Senate with one state, one vote representation, and a House with one person, one vote representation, presidential vetoes, supermajority requirements to amend the constitution, and our electoral college. And our electoral college, of course, as it works today, just ensures that presidential candidates must spread out their base of appeal. You can't be over-reliant on one kind of voter. You have to win votes all across this country. You have to win states in different regions and in di among different you know, subcultures in America, different industries, different kinds of voters in this country. If you can't win those kinds of simultaneous victories in all these, you know, all across the country, you can't get to 270. So it's, you know, the president is the only person in the entire country who is expected to represent all of us. Every other person who's elected to office, you know, a senator represents a single state or a congressman, a single Congress uh, or district, whatever. The president must represent all of us. And this country is too huge and diverse to do, you know, anything except something that's pretty unique to make sure that we're all included. Well, thank you for that that history lesson. And I think it's really interesting that it's become um, a hot topic again. Um, I think Elizabeth Warren ha has spoken on it. Can you talk about why people are rethinking it now um, and what you anticipate happening to the Electoral College going forward, if anything? Well, I think unfortunately there's a perception out there that the system is partisan. You know, I started off saying I, I don't think it is at all, but, but the facts are that Democrats lost the Electoral College in 2000 and 2016, even though they won the popular vote. And so I do think that there's a perception that it's not fair, it's biased against Democrats. I do not think that's true at all. I, the way I see it, it's more like 
pendulum, you know, swinging back and forth, first appearing to favor one side and then appearing to favor the other. But really, it's just got to do with who's doing the best job of reaching out to a variety of voters. I mean, you could think of all sorts of changes in our country's history where the map changed completely, right? Like in, in the 80s, Ronald Reagan was winning California and New York. In the 70s, by the way, he, the, the Democrats were winning Texas. I mean, everything was completely flipped around. You know, you it sure is hard to, to about, imagine a Republican candidate winning California right, right now, isn't it? <laughs> right. And so, but the, you know, the facts are it has changed historically, and there's no such thing as a permanently safe or swing state. Um, it just it changes a lot. And so, you know, to go back to your original question, I do think there's a perception that it's biased. I do think it's turned some people on it. But I, I would really just encourage education and learning about the system and why we have it. I do think that the more we remember why we have the Electoral College, maybe the better our politicians <laughs> will do at, you know, actually caring about America and looking, you know, again, trying to bring everybody together under reminding us why we all the things that we have in common and all the things that we can focus on and celebrate together instead of just satisfying their party and moving on. So how do we get people to reach across the aisle and build those coalitions um, at a time when it just seems so tough to do so? Well, I, I, this is just my personal opinion. I think that it, there's a lot of, uh, I think it's very easy to criticize other people's congressmen or women and everybody thinks their incumbent is the best. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you'll criticize every incumbent on the planet, but yours you're gonna keep go voting for over and over again. And I just wonder if people would be a little bit more, um, maybe pay more attention to what's going on and pay more attention in the primaries, especially when you really have a chance to to change maybe who's in that seat. I, I just think if you're gonna change the status quo, ultimately you gotta change the people. Things. And that is not a slam at any particular person. Both, both parties do it, you know, we all do it. So um, I guess I would just encourage people to pay attention to who you're voting for and to pay attention to your local races too, because the local races tend to be ignored when, when I hope we've all learned this year, they're actually really, really important. <laughs> they matter. Yeah. These local officials claim apparently claim a lot of authority of us over us in certain situations. So they do, and they feel you know you've got to um, kind of get in the pipeline, right? So a lot of those local officials then you know become That's statewide true. officials and the national um, elected officials. So um, they they really do matter. That's true. There's a uh, lot so of people that have been in office for a very long time, and maybe that, that it didn't used to be that way. You know, it, Calvin Coolidge went home, and he he didn't run for re-election and he basically said he felt that it was dangerous to stay in that office for too long. You know, and he didn't say it quite this way. He said it more gracefully, but basically he's like, there's a bunch of yes men around you and it's just, it can go to your head. And so Calvin Coolidge ch chose to go home and he said, it's proper for me to go back to the people. And I think we've lost that um, attitude. And so we just, we end up with all these people who are, and maybe they jump from local office to state office to federal office or whatever it is they do, but they, they're just there for a very long time. And maybe we as voters can, maybe some of them deserve it and some of them don't, but we as voters can pay a lot of attention. So what would you change um, in the electoral college if you could, if you could go back and, and hang out with the founding fathers, would you make any uh, changes to it? I wouldn't, if you'd asked me this question 20 years ago, right after I broke my arm and started all this, I, I probably would have said, I, I mean, I would have said something like, well, maybe you could automate the electoral votes so you don't have an elector who could go, you know, do their own thing. Or maybe you could change the house contingent election. That's the backup election process if nobody gets a majority. But the more I watch it in action, the more I just am kind of observing things over the past two decades, I think, no, you know, if you mess with even one thing, you, you're not quite, that will affect the whole balance. And I don't know what the implications of any of those changes would be, even though they seem kind of simple. I, I, I would just leave it. I think it's a, it's a very good balance. It's served us for centuries. Why mess with it? You know, it's not broken, don't fix it. <laughs> well, and I've heard you um, talk before about the voter fraud angle. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, the Electoral College, it's a benefit that people don't think about very much because it's kind of behind the scenes and you just don't have any reason to think about it. But the Electoral College actually protects the country from fraud or, or even just from human error. And the reason that it does that is because before those kinds of things can affect your election total, you need several things to come together simultaneously. First, you need the national total to be close. And despite recent experience, that actually doesn't happen that often. <laughs> um, 
so not you need the national total to be close. That's one thing. The next thing you need is for the total to be close enough that just swinging one or two states is going to affect your outcome with you. And, and then you need to be able to, those, those states themselves must also be close so that swinging just a few, you know, a few hundred or thousand or whatever votes in those states makes the difference. And then you've got to be able to predict in advance which states these might be so you can go work on it and go steal what votes you're going to try to steal or whatever. These things are all very hard. They don't usually all come together that often. And, you know, the, as far as the predicting part, if you think you can predict a state that might matter, think Ohio in 2004, well, everybody else has predicted it too. And so the place is closely watched. So you've you've limited the places where stealing votes matters. You've made it where you either can't predict it or everybody can predict it. And so you've created a situation where you, instead of having to play defense in every single precinct of the country, because in a national popular vote, of course, you could steal a vote in the bluest blue California precinct or the reddest red Texas one, and it would affect the national total. So in a national popular vote system, you have to be on defense everywhere, all the time. In, with the Electoral College, you can narrow down the number of precincts where you think you might really need to watch. And then you do really need to watch those, but at least it's a, it's a smaller playing field. It's easier to do that. And if there are still problems after the election, look, I really hope this mail-in balloting, you know, furor and all this stuff ends up being not nearly as bad as people anticipate. I think there's a lot of reasons to think that the dynamics I just described to you will make it not such a big deal. But if it does become, if, if there is a national election that's close and if there are a couple of states that could swing it, we will narrow our um, problems down just to a subset of things that we need to solve before we can move on to a certain election outcome. And that's what happened in 2000, of course, where we didn't have to fight over every vote in the nation. We, we did have obviously an extended fight over Florida, but it was a small set of problems to solve. The same thing happened in 1876 when there were some disputes and it basically came down to solving problems in three Southern states. There was one additional elector in Oregon that was disputed, but there's mostly three, three states and we solved the subset of problems and then moved on to an election outcome. And that is way easier to handle than national election with national recounts. And I mean, you can imagine how bad that could be. Well, Tara, it's interesting that you mentioned the mail-in ballot, balloting because I received an extra ballot from somebody who had lived here before. And I think on social media, we're seeing lots of that happening right now, um, which makes me yeah. a little nervous about, about that process. It um, does make me nervous too. Yeah. Well, I now want to turn to, we're getting a lot of um, questions in. One of my colleagues is texting them to me. So I'd like to go ahead okay. and, and open it up to audience questions. Again, please put them in the chat and um, they'll be texted to me so that I can ask Tara. So the first one um, comes from Charlotte. She asks, why do you think it is that younger generations especially are so interested in abolishing the electoral college? Do you think this might have to do at all with education? Oh, it's absolutely got to do with education. Um, you know, one interesting thing that's happened in 2020 with everybody in online school and people are sending me questions or like videos of their kids and like, or I mean, I've, I've listened to what some of these teachers are saying to their kids. Oh, that's it's, fascinating. It's awesome. You're getting first hand accounts. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, they, I mean, I've, I've seen several, I don't, you know, they're coming from different directions and I don't re remember where they all came from, but, but I've seen several and some of the things that I've seen, I thought, well, no wonder they hate it. I mean, this literally the teachers saying things like, yeah, it's this thing that the founders created because they were elitist and it's outdated and we should get rid of it. And that's the lesson, <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> that's not a lesson about the Electoral College. I mean, if, if somebody wants to present pros and cons and because look, there are, th there's no perfect system and I'm not gonna sit here and tell you the Electoral College is perfect because it's, it's not. I mean, I, I sometimes joke that um, there, there's something that Winston Churchill once said and I kind of steal it and adapt it. He, he said, um, he said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others that have been tried. <laughs> so I say the electoral college is the worst system of electing presidents, except for all the others that have been tried. And that would be a fair presentation in a class, right? For this, the teacher to say, look, if you value this more, then maybe you're gonna prefer national popular vote. But if you value this more, and let me tell you the benefits and why it was adopted, things that I've talked here about, you know, balancing the needs of the majority and the minority and making sure that the sheep doesn't get eaten. I mean, these, this is a fair presentation. But the vast majority of our younger children are not getting that. And so my suggestion for anybody who cares about the Electoral College and who wants 
you know, I mean, teach your own kid about this because it, you look, you might get a good teacher who does a good job, but a lot of them don't like the system and they don't spend much time on it in class. And so your, your kids aren't, aren't uh, learning about it. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I think now um, in this time, it, it's interesting. People are paying a little bit more attention to what students are being taught and sometimes right. shocked by what they're being taught, like it sounds like. Right. And you have been a little bit on the electoral right. college. Um, so I have a question from Grace who asks, is there another time in history where one party tried to abolish the electoral college? There have been all sorts of attempts, <laughs> you know, for better or for worse. There have been all sorts of attempts to abolish the Electoral College. Um, there have been a lot of them. I, I think one of the major attempts, I'll just maybe say this, that might surprise people, in kind of the late 60s and early 70s, there was a major movement to try to get rid of it. It was probably one of the ones that came closer to success. But one of the groups that came to the defense of the Electoral College were civil rights leaders. And that's maybe surprising today because today we hear all these allegations that it's just founded in slavery or something, which is not true, but people say it. And in the early 70s, civil rights leaders were, they were writing editorials, they were testifying before Congress, and they wanted to keep the system because they said, we are treated better under this system than we would be under a national popular vote. And they had all sorts of reasons for that. You know, they, they talked about, um, Vernon Jordan, he, he went up there and he was testifying. He was saying, look, blacks are 10% of the population, but in the electoral college, because of our strength in certain areas like big cities in New York or whatever, we can have an outsized influence in, in one state. And so then that helps us to have an outsized influence in the nation as a whole. And, and he just felt like they had more influence. And he said, if you get rid of the electoral college, we'll just go back to being 10% of the vote again. And, and that's no good. And he talked about the benefits of coalition building as I've been talking about. Um, because if you're in a city with other other voters and you've got a wide variety of cultures and you've got all these different people mingling together, he said they tend to understand our concerns. We find shared concerns, not only in the community, but we start to understand each other better. And so he talked, he and he went on, his testimony before Congress is well worth reading. But, um, but that was definitely, you know, a moment in time when people were talking about getting rid of the Electoral College and maybe people were taking sides that were not the same as today. And so, um, you know, I guess I'm just gonna go back to, I've said it's like a pendulum and I think it appears to be favoring one party at one time or one kind of voter at one time, but really it's just, it's a, it's a moving, it's just moving. It, it depends on who's doing the best job of appealing to a wide variety of voters. Well, let me ask a follow-up to that. If um, the electoral college, college was abolished, um, what would replace it? Have you heard any any proposals of what people would like to see replace it beyond just a popular vote? So the most likely scenario at this point in time, a constitutional amendment is very hard. It takes three quarters of the states. So there is a group that is trying another route. Um, it's called the National Popular Vote Group. It's based in California. And they are trying to get it done through a simple contract, okay, an interstate compact among states. And by the terms of the contract, they say that any state that has signed on to the contract would give all of their electors to the winner of the national popular vote. Right now, the, the contract goes into effect when they have 270 electors signed on to it. Right now, they have 15 states plus DC that have all signed this contract. That's Whoa, 100 15 states? Where geographically? Yes. Do you know? Uh, they're, all, they're all over. This is California, New York, New Jersey. The thing that they have in common is they're all blue states. Okay, so, so I was wondering um, if they, yes. Yeah, uh, but... Um, 15 states plus DC, it's 196 electors, so they need 74 more. Now, of course, if they get that contract signed and they try to put into effect, it's too late for this year, but in 2024, there's going to be lawsuits, obviously, about whether this is constitutional or not. But, um, but that, I would say, is the most likely route to change at this point in time, um, or at least an attempted change. So there really is a serious organized effort yes. that, that people should be aware of. Yes, and in fact, if anybody's watching this from Colorado, this is on your ballot this year because the Colorado legislature passed it, but citizens got um, some, uh, enough signatures to get it put on the ballot. They're trying to take back what the legislature did. So if you were to want to vote in favor of the Electoral College, that's a no vote in Colorado. Um, obviously, if you wanted to vote for the National Popular Vote Contact, that would be a yes vote. And, and what advice do you have um, for a young woman who's having a discussion with a peer on campus about the Electoral College? What do you think is the most convincing argument? 
Oh, I think it'd be great if there were those kinds of conversations on campus. You know, look, I, I, I don't mean to sound too simple or whatever, but I do kind of go back to the two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner argument a lot, just because I think it is so, uh, it's just, it's a picture in your mind, right? You can see what it is. And I do think that that's what would happen if we didn't have an electoral college. We would have a situation where voters, you know, we would end up with political parties that would cater to one kind of voter, and then they would just be, um, they would not be paying attention to a wide variety of voters, and that's the kind of dynamic that would occur. And check back uh, to our new Facebook page for more uh, programming on national and popular topics. Thank you.